America and the app. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke. Just as a reminder, Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Somerville Community Access TV or some community TV station who is kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them I say thank you. Or you're watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, this time on my own personal webpage, not on the um, Boston Free Radio Facebook group, unfortunately, but I'm going to fix that. But either way, you can join me. I'm glad you can join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So I have four movies to review for you for this show. First, though, I'm going to get into my normal segment, What's Topping the Box Office? The top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. And it should come as a surprise to absolutely no one that the number one film this week is the same as the number one film last week. And will probably remain the number one film for this coming week. Weekend, Deadpool might actually challenge. Event. I mean, it, it, it inevitably will challenge Avengers: Infinity War. But will it take the number one spot? We'll have to see next weekend, or at least when I do my show two weekends from now. But this is pretty amazing because Avengers: Infinity War made over two hundred million dollars last weekend, making it the highest grossing weekend of any film of all time. This weekend, it didn't do too shabbily either. It made $114.8 million, and that's just in the United States. Against a budget of $300 to $400 million, somewhere in that range, Avengers Infinity War so far made $453.1 million here in the States. Around the world, it has made, get this, $1.168 billion. So Avengers Infinity War has made over a billion dollars in two weeks around the world. That has got to be a record. I have never seen that done before in the four years I've hosted the show. So, the number one highest grossing debut film of the week didn't actually really hold a candle to Avengers Infinity War, but it did pretty well, given its budget. That movie was Overboard, the remake of the 1987 movie starring Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell. That is one of the movies I'll be reviewing for you for this show, so I'll keep my opinions about the movie to myself until this movie, well, until I get to the review. But this weekend, Overboard made $14.7 million, which is just over $100 million less than Avengers Infinity War made. And that... But that's against a budget of $12 million. I don't have the international numbers for you for this movie so far, but Overboard here in the States already is a tentative hit. And that's pretty good for a first weekend out. A Quiet Place is doing extremely well, especially given its competition. This weekend it made only $7.8 million and slid from number two last week to number three this week. But... Against a budget of $17 million, A Quiet Place has so far made $160.1 million here in the States and $255.5 million worldwide. So that's a win not only for a movie of this budget, but also for director and star of this movie, John Krasinski. That's probably his biggest achievement as a director so far. And it is a permanent, excuse me, a certified hit here in the States and around the world. I Feel Pretty in its third week in release is number four at the box office this weekend, sliding from number three last week. I Feel Pretty made $5.1 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $32 million, I Feel Pretty has made so far in the United States $37.9 million, and around the world it has made $45.8 million, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. And it could become a certified hit in a couple of weeks. Of course, it has some very tough competition Competition ahead. Rampage is number five at the box office this weekend, sliding from number four last week. It made $4.6 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $120 million, it's struggling a little bit. It's made $84.8 million here in the States and $378.8 million worldwide. So although it is a certified hit around the world, it is not a hit here in the States. It, but it's only been out for about four weeks, so... That may change in a couple of weeks. Tully debuted this week along with Overboard, one of the few movies to debut this week. It's the number two highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it is number six at the box office 
this weekend, having grossed just three point three. <clears throat> excuse me, million dollars. Now I don't have the budget for this movie, and I don't also don't know how it how much it grossed worldwide. Probably not much more than three point three million dollars, but. I am going to move on because I can't tell you what kind of hit this movie is, if it is in fact a hit. But my estimate is that the budget was probably no more than $10 million. But again, I don't know for sure. I may know for sure next week. Black Panther is still hanging in there in its 12th week in release, even though Avengers Infinity War is on its way to making more money internationally than Black Panther is. But just a little bit of a spoiler, it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Here's how much it, it is certified by. It made $3.3 million at the U.S. box office this weekend, but against a budget of $200 million, Black Panther has so far made $693.2 million here in the States and $1.338 billion worldwide. So Avengers Infinity War is very, very close to catching up. Here's what are the numbers. In 12 weeks, it took Black Panther $1.338... It took Black Panther... 12 weeks to make $1.338 billion. It took two weeks for Avengers Infinity War to make $1.168 billion. So it's probably going to outgross Black Panther next week. Truth or Dare is number eight at the box office this weekend, having made $1.9 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $3.5 million, though, Truth or Dare has made $38.2 million here in the States and $58.6 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world, regardless of whether you loved or hate it. Hated it. Super Troopers 2 dropped from number 6 last week to number 9 this week, having made $1.9 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of just $13.5 million, though, Super Troopers 2 has so far made $25.5 million at the U.S. box office and $26.3 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world, but very close to being a certified hit, and it may be a certified hit by next week. And finally, number 10 of the box office, Blockers, made $1.8 million at the U.S. box office this weekend against a budget of $21 million. Blockers has so far made $56.2 million here in the States and $81.1 million worldwide, making it a certified hit in both instances. I'm a 40-year-old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma. It was very hard for me, but Miss Araceli, she gave me direction. At age 47, Marco finished his high school diploma. 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Greetings and welcome to the beautiful me club. Boston Free Radio is where you will find a variety of hosts that will entertain you throughout the week. But join What's the Word Radio every Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. DJ Armador, Lady Scorpia, DJ Spriggs, and Jono are here to bring the latest, greatest, real news to you as well as great music. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Overboard. Now, this is a remake of the movie from 1987, starring Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell. It's a movie that I actually have not seen, so because of that reason, I was a little reluctant to see Overboard, but then again, given that Avengers Infinity War is dominating the box office right now, and not a lot of new movies are coming out right now this past weekend I kind of really didn't have a choice but to see this film but in a way I have an advantage to seeing the remake of Overboard because I can see what works in this film and not necessarily compare it to the original and not only have I not seen Overboard I don't exactly know what the status of Overboard is the Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell movie amongst movie fans I, I know it's probably not as revered a movie with um, it's not as revered 
of Goldie Hawn's movies as compared to maybe The Cactus Flower or Private Benjamin, but it's also not as detested as The Out of Towners, the remake she did with Steve Martin, for instance. But in any event, the new Overboard is, for those of you who don't know, about a spoiled wealthy yacht owner who in this movie is played by Mexican comedian Eugenio Derbez, who is thrown overboard and becomes the target of revenge from his mistreated employee, who is played by Anna Faris. So a little bit of background about Anna Faris's character. Anna Faris is a single mother in this film who is studying for a nursing degree and in the meantime working two jobs, one as a pizza delivery woman and also another one as a cleaning lady for this wealthy yacht owner's yacht just to make ends meet. So when she first encounters this wealthy yacht owner, whose name in the movie is Leonardo, and he's played by Eugenio Derbez. Uh, Leonardo is not a self-made billionaire at all. He actually mooches off his wealthy father, who is one of the top ten wealthiest people in the world in this movie universe. And in initially... Leonardo actually fires Anna Ferris' character, Kate, because she won't bring him a passion fruit, even though Anna Ferris' character's job is to clean the carpets, not do anything for the owner of the, the yacht, so to speak. So anyway, she gets fired from her job, and when Leonardo is cruising the high seas, he ends up actually falling off the boat and somehow he washes up ashore of this coastal town in which Anna Ferris's character is a resident and he loses all memory of who he is. So Anna Ferris's character knows exactly who he is and devises a scheme to take advantage of his amnesia and convince this man that he is her husband and that her daughters are actually his although the fact that he's mexican and the daughters are caucasian is certainly a running gag in this movie in fact Anna Faris's character convinces Eugenio Derbez's character that while he is the legal father of these daughters she actually impregnated herself through surrogacy because Eugenio Derbez is, or his character, is sterile. So, from there, hilarity ensues. And it's a little bit predictable how the, the story goes in this film. But, with its predictability in terms of a story arc, I actually like this film a lot better than I thought it was. And I was particularly impressed by Eugenio Derbez. Now, Eugenio Derbez, for those of you who don't know, is a comedian who is from Mexico. He's actually a native of Mexico City. He's um, relatively older than most um, newcomers. He's... Let me just do the math in my head. He is 55 years old as of the date of this show, um, May 8th, 2018. And he first came to international prominence in a movie he not only starred in but also produced called Instructions Not Included. And that was apparently one of the biggest Mexican films or highest grossing Mexican-American films. Uh, excuse me highest grossing Mexican films of all time. He then crossed over statewide in a movie he released last year called How to Be a Latin Lover, which had its moments, but actually Overboard was a much better vehicle for him, particularly reintroducing him to the stateside audience, particularly those who don't speak Spanish. And I thought not only was he very charismatic in this film, but he also displayed a lot of very impressive physical comedy, which I probably haven't seen in in this magnitude since Jim Carrey did his last uh, physical comedy or good physical comedy in Bruce Almighty. But I was actually really impressed by how well Eugenio Derbez did in this film. I also liked Anna Ferris, but this being a remake of a Goldie Hawn film, I did feel like sometimes, particularly in the first scene where Anna Ferris and Eugenio Derbez meet and have a confrontation, that Anna Ferris played a little bit 
too much like Goldie Hawn in, in her mannerisms and her facial expressions. But after this one scene, I thought that Anna Ferris actually came into her own a lot more and, and did a, a much better job acting like herself rather than acting like uh, a Goldie Hawn clone. I also really liked some of the supporting performances in this movie, including one by Ava Longoria, who I actually was a little surprised at first wasn't the co-star of of this movie but then again she she actually did pretty well playing Anna Ferris's best friend and she also has a guy in this movie who plays her husband who I was also very impressed by and his his name is actually I'm uh, right now I'm I'm doing the research and oh here it is he, He's played by Mel Rodriguez, who's not only Eva Longoria's husband in this in this movie, but he also plays um, Eugenio Derbez's character's boss when Anna Faris convinces Eugenio Derbez that he's a construction worker, not a spoiled daddy's boy. So I liked Overboard a lot better than I thought I would. When it, when it first began, I thought about giving it my rating of a checkout, but it actually is a knockout because Eugenio Derbez and Anna Faris have amazing chemistry together that starts off weak, but progresses as the film goes on. I really believe their love story and Eugenio Derbez himself was the selling point. He was hilarious. Hi, we're the Goo Goo Dolls. We're fortunate that our daughters have what they need to grow and learn. But that isn't the case for nearly 13 million kids in the U.S. that struggle with hunger. Childhood hunger is a heartbreaking reality that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and provides it to families and children in need. You can help kids in need in your community by visiting feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Tully. This is the latest by director Jason Reitman, writer, screenwriter, and story writer Diablo Cody, and star Charlize Theron. Now, you probably know Jason Reitman from a number of films he's directed. He's actually the son of Ivan Reitman, who has produced such classics as Animal House and Ghostbusters, just to name a few. But Jason Reitman has produced a number of movies, and the movies he has directed include Thank You for Smoking, which I think is actually an underrated film from uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, He rose to prominence when he directed Juno, which also Diablo Cody wrote and won an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay for Writing. And he has since directed Up in the Air, Young Adult, Labor Day, and several other films uh, of note. And this is his third collaboration with Diablo Cody and his second collaboration with Diablo Cody and Charlize Theron. The last film all three of them worked on together was Young Adult from 2011. But despite the fact that the three of them are working together on this movie, Tully is not actually a sequel to Young Adult. It is an entirely different film, whereas Charlie's, Charlie's Theron plays an entirely different character. In this movie, Charlie's Theron plays a mother of three by the name of Marlo, who hires a night nanny to help with her newborn. And Marlo is a woman who is very stressed out, 
When we first meet her, she has two children and one on the way. And she does have a devoted husband named Drew, who's played in this movie by Ron Livingston. But with Drew working hard to support the family and Marlo being on maternal leave, she still needs a lot of help, especially given that her middle child, her youngest son, is actually autistic. The movie doesn't actually say that he's autistic. In fact, all the characters in the film, particularly those who are not his parent, keep calling him quirky. And I, I found that kind of interesting that everyone in this film called him quirky. I'm, I'm not sure if that's if autism is such a taboo subject. I, I don't think it is now as much as it was years ago. But either way, quirky is the word that gets tossed around by by the child's teachers staff members at his school and friends of the family but in any event marlo is stressed out even though she's on maternal leave and she does in unorthodox well what what would have been unorthodox even 10 years ago but what a lot of parents in her neighborhood are trying in that she hires a night nanny by the name of tully who is played by canadian actress mackenzie davis and the name might not sound particularly familiar to you but she's been in a number of movies i remember her best from the movie the martian where she plays one of the nasa engineers who assists in bringing matt damon's character home she was also in last year's blade runner 2049 and she was one of the only good actors in the movie that awkward moment from 2014 which is a movie that i otherwise hated but i liked michael b jordan and mackenzie davis in that movie and here she does a a really good job playing this girl who's just out of college in reality mackenzie davis is 30 but she still looks like she could pass for being in her early 20s for now kind of like greta gerwig and even though being a night nanny, working a night shift, is not a job that a lot of people would thrive in or really love, it turns out that Tully is one of the best things to happen to Marlo and her family and does a lot of great things around the house, not only taking care of the newborn baby, but also cleaning and eventually providing a lot of moral and emotional support, particularly for Marlo herself. And there are parts in this movie where things get a little weird. I'm not going to exactly say how, but there is one particular scene involving Tully wanting to spice up the sex life of Marlo and and Drew, even though yeah, bringing a third person into the act, particularly one who babysits and takes care of a baby, is a little weird, but I suppose it happens. But in the context of this film, it works pretty well. What I really loved about this film is Charlize Theron's performance in general. And again, she plays an entirely different character from the one she plays in Young Adult. And the, the differences I won't get into because of, of time, but either way, Charlize Theron was very good in Young Adult. I actually thought she was better in Tully. I think she played somebody who is certainly very relatable. And even though Charlize Theron is exceptionally gorgeous, in this movie, she gained a noticeable amount of weight for her role. And a, a lot of people have been describing her weight gain as brave i wouldn't go that far but she certainly was very believable and i think this is probably her best role on screen since monster and probably a notch below monster because monster considering she played the character eileen vornos and completely changed her look so much that you couldn't even recognize her in addition to having a great performance it's it's really incomparable to any other role she's played but if we were to compare i would probably put her performance in tully as second best and i loved the the dynamic that went on between Charlize Theron and Mackenzie Davis. I think not only is this Charlize Theron's second best role to date, 
behind Monster. I think this is Mackenzie Davis's best role to date. And I think you're going to be seeing a lot more of Mackenzie Davis getting more of the attention she deserves. And maybe not unfavorable comparisons to actresses with whom she bears a passing resemblance like Zoe Deschanel. So Tully gets my rating of a knockout. It certainly represents not only a great acting performance by the likes of Charlize Theron and Mackenzie Davis. I think Jason Reitman directed this film very well. I loved not only the cinematography, but also the set design and the lighting, particularly those at night. It's certainly lighting that makes a difference in terms of the mood of this film. And Diablo Cody, last but not least, shows a lot of maturity in her writing and, and, and certainly when she won the Academy Award for writing for Juno, she certainly deserved that. But now that she's grown as a writer and as a person, and she's writing about more mature characters, her writing certainly reflects that. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Wildfire smoke can cause health problems for anyone, especially those with heart and lung conditions, older adults, and children. Listen for advice from local authorities. Avoid burning candles using gas stoves or vacuuming. Do not use dust masks as they will retain harmful particles. If you have asthma or other lung conditions, follow your respiratory management plan. See a doctor if you have a hard time breathing. I love those real six sides They're the ones that move me The thinly blown Neurotic toe Intensify and groove me Listen more on Unpopular Music, Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Roxanne, Roxanne. This is a movie that is a Netflix original and can be seen only on Netflix, unless they decide to release it on DVD sometime soon. But right now, if you have a Netflix account, you can check out this movie. This movie was actually released on March 23rd and was one of those films that I saw actually for the first time a little while ago, and then I wanted to to just see it again just to get more of a a sense of the story and some of the characters and I don't usually watch films more than twice, particularly new films. Some classics like It's a Wonderful Life I'll certainly watch again and again year after year, but a lot of the new films I usually see it once, and I'm okay with that, but Roxanne Roxanne was a movie I wanted to see again for some reason, and interestingly enough, I enjoyed it a lot more the second time I saw it than the first time. So Roxanne Roxanne tells the true story about... A woman by the name of Roxanne Shante, or at least that's her, that's her stage name, who in the early 80s was the most feared battle MC in Queens, New York, and was a fierce teenage girl with the weight of the world on her shoulders. At the age of 14, Lolita Roxanne Shante Gooden was well on her way to becoming a hip-hop legend as she hustled to provide for her family while defending herself from the dangers of the streets of the Queens Bridge Project in New York City. So this movie has some familiar faces in it, including Nia Long, who actually plays um, Roxanne Shante's mother in this film and has a terrific performance in here. Also of note is Academy Award winner Mahershala Ali, who plays a pimp by the name of Cross, with whom Roxanne Shante develops a relationship, even though she is well underage. So there's there are some legality issues in there but being that it's the Queensbridge projects and that there's there there's a whole politics going on there it's not um it, it, it's not quite as difficult a, a thing to accept that a 16 year old would have a relationship with somebody who is much older than her in that environment but in any event it's it's still controversial and in addition to Neil Long and Maharshala Ali, I got to give a lot of credit for this film, uh, for this film being as great as, as it is to its star, Shante Adams. And it might be a little bit of a coincidence that 
Shante Adams has the same middle name as Lolita Shante Gooden. And she's known as Shante in this film throughout. But Shante Adams, I don't know actually very much about her, except for the fact that Roxanne Roxanne is actually one of... It's not only her her big screen debut, but it's also... Let me rephrase this. It's not only her first starring role, it's also her big screen debut, if you don't count a short she starred in called Love is a Growing Up. She's going to be seen a little bit later in the year in a movie called Monsters and Men, which has gotten a very limited release, and it's one that I haven't seen yet, but this is her first starring role. She does an amazing job in this film. Uh, She's going to be in a movie... Actually, another movie later this year called Good Girls Get High, but I don't know anything about that. But yeah, Roxanne Roxanne, despite having not been released in the theaters, or maybe at least not for a limited amount of time, is a really good biopic about somebody who started off when rap was in its infancy. infancy and wasn't quite the worldwide phenomenon it is today it's probably the best hip-hop biopic since straight out of compton i mean it's it's hard to follow straight out of compton but i i actually think that the acting in this film is slightly better than it was in straight out of compton and the acting in straight out of compton was mostly great so it is directed and written by michael larner And Michael Larner is an African-American director who, before Roxanne Roxanne, directed a feature film called Cronies, which I have not actually seen. It's a movie that looks like it's in black and white. And even though I was hosting this, this show in 2015, Cronies is a movie that kind of went under my radar. But this is another movie that Michael Larnell has directed and written. And Roxanne Roxanne tells the story about a female rapper who was long before Nicki Minaj, MC Light, Salt and Pepper, but who really established a place in the genre for female rappers and did not get the credit she deserved really until this movie came out. Certainly when around the time this movie takes place in the early to mid 80s Roxanne Rox oh, excuse me Roxanne Shante has a great deal of underground success and a little and a little bit of a taste of mainstream success she makes it so that even at the young age of 16 she's able to battle other rappers and some wannabes some legitimate in Queens New York but after her rise to fame, she kind of disappeared from the scene. And today she's still around, uh, Roxanne Shante, that is. She's uh, 48 years old as of the date of the show. And while there might be some questions to the historical accuracy of Roxanne Roxanne, I think this is an incredibly well-acted film, a very well-directed film. And the part in particular where Shante Adams and Mahershala Ali actually get together and have a family that's probably one of the most gripping parts of this film in fact there's one great shot which i won't give away entirely but it goes right from the first time the two of them have sex to the time where she gives birth to their first child to one of their first nights after the child is born and the setup for that scene is incredible it's probably one of the most iconic scenes and probably one of the most well-edited scenes I've ever seen. So Roxanne Roxanne is a movie I've seen twice. I liked it even better the first time than the, excuse me, the second time than the first time. And it gets my rating of a knockout. I think it is a top rated or top notch biopic. I hope it gets some attention at the end of the year during the award ceremonies. I'm not sure if it's eligible for Oscars given some of the rules that dictate TV movies, but I hope as many people see it as possible. In the wake of a disaster, what one thing can you send that will help people the most? A blanket, a tent, a sandbag, 
a doctor. Actually, if you send a monetary donation, you send all these things. Even a small donation can make a big impact and can quickly become exactly what people affected by disaster need most. In the wake of a hurricane, your monetary donation can make a huge difference to those in need. To donate, visit supporthurricanerelief.org. That's supporthurricanerelief.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. This is not a test. You are listening to Boston Free Radio. Next Wednesday, we have Reverb Nation artist Karen Gretner up on Joe Vig's Pop Explosion, where they will be talking about her latest single, album, and so much more. Tune in next Wednesday for Karen Gretner, Reverb Nation artist, highlight of the week. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage, and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to review for you is another Netflix original. Again, not many movies came out in theaters this weekend. And in addition to that, I had a very busy weekend. But this Netflix original is a documentary called The Rachel Divide. Pun definitely intended. This is a documentary that tells the story of Rachel Dolezal. And if that movie, or excuse me, if that name doesn't sound particularly familiar to you, basically she is the woman, the white woman from Spokane, Washington, who made national headlines and was the butt of many late night jokes when she was outed as a white woman despite passing for years as a black woman and even being head of the NAACP chapter in her local Spokane, Washington community. So this is a movie that I've been a little reluctant to review for you because, first of all, documentaries are much harder to review than fictional films. But also... Oh, Rachel Dolezal is um, a character I have mixed feelings about. And by, well, a character, I mean a human being. First of all, what's really uh, polarizing about Rachel Dolezal is that as the head of her local NAACP chapter, she did a lot for the black community, which I applaud. But at the same time... She was and is spending her life pretending to be something she's not. And when I first heard about her on the news and I saw that infamous clip where a local Spokane, Washington news reporter actually asked her point blank, are you African-American and is your father or mother African-American? She completely dodged the question. And I thought to myself, oh, God. Oh, boy. (laughs) Because it's one thing to be a white person and to, to, to support causes for African Americans, be part of protest rallies against police brutality and the many problems facing the African American community. I'm all for that. But it's another thing to 
spray tan yourself and pretend to be a member of the black community. That is much dicier. It, it's different with somebody like John Howard Griffin, who colored himself black to do research for the book, which ultimately became a movie, Black Like Me. Now, in one of the rare instances of this show, I have not seen the movie, but I have read the book. But that's different because that's for research purposes. When you're intentionally trying to be something you're not, and the whole world knows that, that's where it gets really tricky. And to this day, Rachel Dolezal still considers herself an African-American woman, while, interestingly enough, acknowledging in interviews that both of her birth parents are white. So this movie gets to the heart of Ms. Dolezal's life story, and it's mostly told through her perspective with a little bit of emphasis or rather a little bit this whole subject is making me very uncomfortable but some of her adopted siblings who are actually black also contribute to her side of the story but you're not really given an antithesis from her parents or her actual birth brother or even the man to whom she was married because they don't make an appearance in this documentary at all and i think that would have given this this movie a little bit more of a full circle but what really weakens this documentary is not the subject because lover or hater rachel dolezal is a fascinating figure although one i severely disagree with in many instances but What's interesting about what this documentary doesn't do particularly well is organize itself. It doesn't really tell a story. It tells parts of Rachel Dolezal's life in bits and pieces, and the pieces don't really come together. You're not, you have to be re reminded of who her character is what characters there are in the documentary and by characters i I of course mean real people but it it just doesn't have a a good narrative flow to it it tells you bits and pieces of rachel dolezal's life story how she's coping with her infamy now how she chooses her her who she's who she wants to be interviewed by in, in the press be it somebody on the today show or somebody or the the group of ladies on the talk show the real which is on BET and there there's some good footage of those news shows that are shown and certainly some some intricate things to extrapolate from this from this documentary like some of the reactions of the people with whom Rachel Dolezal encounters, both white and black. But it's not told in a particularly organized way, and that is really unfortunate. And there's an interesting part of this documentary where Ms. Dolezal actually says, the whole world just wants me to say I'm white and then everything will just be okay. Well, no, it, it won't be okay, but it's at least a start but you could tell from the the details of her strict upbringing in montana that eh, something went went wrong with her mentally and it may not have entirely been her fault but it is interesting to see some of the reactions with of people around her. In fact, her infamy has become so great now that when she drops her kids off at school or even drops them at the barber shop, she has to be cautious not only of not of getting out of the car but also where she parks. I found that interesting, but this movie could have been this documentary could have been organized a lot better. But I was sort of torn between giving this movie a strikeout and a checkout, but I'd give it a checkout because at least director and writer Laura Brownson chose a fascinating topic, and it was amazing she got the access to Rachel Dolezal's inner circle as she did. But then again, Rachel Dolezal probably wants some of the attention, which is probably the reason why she is still masquerading or still considering herself to be a black woman. Certainly, she's a troubled woman. Listen and imagine. (laughs) 
It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Boston Come Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? And the black experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And I have exhausted my list of movies that I'm going to review for you for the show. I only had four this this week, but that's a lot better than having one or two, I suppose. Particularly because if I had one or two, this would be a very short show. And I always keep it to an hour. But now I'm going to get into a segment I might make regular, especially given its success last week. And that is, I'm, I'm going to just give you a little bit of a preview of movies that are coming out on DVD and streaming today. So in terms of movies that are coming out on DVD, there aren't many of them. Unfortunately, one of the movies that's coming out on DVD and Blu-ray and 4K is Fifty Shades Freed. Yep, this is a movie that's already what I consider to be the worst film of 2018. But if you must see it, it is out on DVD and Blu-ray. And and by the way, by me announcing what's coming out on DVD and Blu-ray this week, I'm not necessarily endorsing it. I'm just telling you what's out. Very much like my segment, What's Coming Out Next, which is a spoken word preview of the movies that are coming out this coming weekend, which will be after this break. I am telling you what's coming out. I'm not necessarily saying whether you should see it or not. But with that said, I am giving my opinion about the film. And Fifty Shades Freed sucked hard. It was a terrible film. So another movie that's coming out on DVD is actually, and Blu-ray, is a movie that is direct-to-video. It's called Batman Ninja. And I have actually not seen this, so let me actually see what the the premise of it is. It is a cell-drawn animated film, and it actually is direct, it, it comes out of Japan, if you can believe it. It's directed by Junpei Mizuzaki. And it's a movie that details Batman, along with a number of his allies and adversaries, finds himself transplanted from modern Goth- Gotham City to feudal Japan. So this is taking a little bit of the early story arc of Batman Begins. Whether or not it's Influenced by Batman Begins, I don't know, but even though I don't necessarily go to watch direct-to-video films, this actually looks pretty fascinating. I mean, I don't know what villains are in it. I don't know how good the animation quality is, although Japanese animation, love it or hate it, is usually very good, but that's a movie I might see and I might review for you next week. But again, movies that come directly to DVD or Blu-ray are not ones I seek out intentionally, but it certainly looks like an interesting one. Also, for those of you who are fans of... TV shows. The first season of Dear White People is out on DVD. And the Dear White People TV show is actually, not only is it based on the excellent film from 2014, which I loved and actually still love, and I'd love to see what director and writer Justin Simeon comes up with next, it certainly put Tessa Thompson on the map and probably should have put Tayona Paris, her co star, on the map. But Dear White People, the TV show I've heard great things about, and even though I have a Netflix account, I haven't gotten around to actually seeing the TV show, but if you want to see it, it's still out on Netflix, and interestingly enough, it's out on DVD. It actually kind of surprises me that, given its accessibility on Netflix, that Netflix would bother to even release it on DVD, but it's not the first TV series that's been released season 
uh, long on, on DVD. They've also released House of Cards and Orange is the New Black on DVD, and it must be working for them because they still keep releasing them. So another movie that's coming out on, this is an actual movie this time, that's coming out on DVD today is one called Human Flow. And that's another film I missed. And it's actually looks like it's an Indian film. And it is a documentary. And this is a movie that is directed by... I Oh, gosh. I, I have to pronounce this. I'm not going to pronounce his name because I know I'm going to make a fool out of myself. His first name is spelled A-I, and his last name is spelled W-E-I-W-E-I. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name, but it is about director and artist by that name who detail who has a detailed and heartbreaking exploration into the global refugee crisis. Now, this is a film that was released last year. It's coming out on DVD now. It was nominated for a number of awards, but it was not actually nominated for any Oscars. Although it would have been a shoe in probably for best documentary feature, especially given its subject, but that just goes to show you how crowded the documentary field is every year. As a matter of fact, just to go on a little bit of a tangent, I I say this every year, I am always wrong about the documentary feature category. I mean, every year I see plenty of amazing documentaries, probably at least 10 every year. And there are some I feel extremely strongly about that don't get the Oscar recognition that they deserve. Some of the documentaries that I've seen that I absolutely loved include Life Itself, the documentary about Roger Ebert, directed by Hoop Dreams director Stephen James. Also, Hodorowski's Dune, uh, last year's An Inconvenient Sequel, which didn't get as much Oscar attention as An Inconvenient Truth. But in any event, I think... Playing devil's advocate, the reason that the documentaries of my choice don't make don't necessarily make it to be nominated is because there are a lot of great and compelling documentaries out there, and it's really hard to choose the best of the best of the best. I often I often have a hard time choosing my top ten best films of the year just in general. But in any event, there are several good films or potentially good films and 50 shades free that are coming out on blu-ray and dvd today uh there isn't much coming out on or on streaming today but there are a couple of noteworthy movies that are coming out on netflix today and they include desolation and iri kondu kondabalu Warn your relatives. I don't know what that film's about, but it sounds like an interesting... (laughs) It certainly sounds like a very interesting movie based on its title. And there are no films that are coming out today on um, Amazon Prime, but actually Amazon Prime's coming out with a remake of the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. This time it's a series, an original series, not the movie. Uh, on May 12th, un- unfortunately, it's coming out with Baywatch, amongst other films. So that's my segment. What's coming out? Don't ignore facial redness. It could be an early warning sign of rosacea, a life disruptive facial disorder that gets worse without treatment. Over time, the redness becomes more persistent and tiny blood vessels may appear. Without medical help, bumps, pimples, and even facial disfigurement often develop. 16 million Americans have rosacea. Yet only a small fraction are being treated. Don't ignore the warning signs. See a dermatologist or visit the National Rosacea Society at rosacea.org. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word. dot blogspot. dot com. Toppers.
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed all the films that I have to review for you for this show, and I've given you my list of movies that are coming out on DVD and streaming today and some this week, it's now time for me to get into my final segment of the show, which is what's coming out next. These are the most noteworthy films that are coming out in theaters this coming weekend. They're coming out in a theater near you, unless I say otherwise. And just another note, this is not necessarily an endorsement of the films that are coming out. This is just sort of a, a a recap of films that are coming out this coming weekend and whether or not I'm going to see them. I am not endorsing these films, and I'm also not telling you not to see them. That, of course, is unless it has Fifty Shades in the title. But, well, I, I didn't say you... C- not to go see that movie either but again this is totally my opinion but i'm going to try to inject as little of my opinion into the segment as possible so you you probably know that the next deadpool movie is coming out but it's not coming out this weekend it's coming out next weekend what's coming out this weekend is no most noteworthy the new melissa mccarthy movie life of the party which is directed by her husband ben falcone and this is a movie about a woman who after her husband abruptly asks for a divorce this woman this middle-aged mother returns to college in order to complete her degree so life of the party from some of the posters i've seen almost seems kind of like the Rodney Dangerfield vehicle back to school, but they might, it it certainly is in terms of theme, almost identical, but hopefully they don't completely rip off that Rodney Dangerfield classic, which I still love and is one of the few films I've seen multiple times. And because Rodney Dangerfield is Rodney Dangerfield, I laughed a lot at that movie. But Melissa McCarthy should probably bring a little bit more of a feminist slant to this movie while still making it fun. We'll have to see. But this is a movie I will definitely see this coming weekend, and I will review it for you in next week's show. Another movie that's coming out this coming weekend is a movie called Breaking In. This movie stars Gabrielle Union as a woman who fights to protect her family during a home invasion. So this is a movie that actually looks like the David Fincher movie, which stars Jodie Foster, the one called Safe Room. And well, it it might not be exactly the same, but it certainly has the same kind of theme. The movie stars Gabrielle Union, Billy Burke, no relation, Richard Cabral, and Agiona Alexis, who probably plays Gabrielle Union's daughter in this movie, at least I'm guessing. Now, the director of this film, James McTeague, is a director who I'm not sure where he's from, but he's had a lot of experience as an assistant director. This is his fourth film, actually, oh, actually his fifth film that he's directed. He made his directorial debut in 2005 with uh, V for Vendetta, which I think came out in 2006, even though it says 2005 on the on the poster. I remember seeing it in theaters in 2006, but no matter. In any event, he followed that up a few years later with Ninja Assassin, then The Raven, and a movie called Survivor, which stars Pierce Brosnan. So this is his first film since that movie Survivor, which is another film that came out in 2015, and despite the fact that I was doing the show in 2015, Survivor is a movie I missed. I I can see a lot of movies, but I can't see them all. But in any event, Breaking In is a movie I definitely will see, especially given that I love Gabrielle Union. I think she is an underrated actress, not to mention she is drop-dead gorgeous. But Breaking In is a film that I will see and I will review for you for next week. This next movie is one that might not be coming out in a theater near you, but I'm just going to tell you what it is anyway. It's a movie called Dark Crimes, and this movie stars, of all people, Jim Carrey. And it is not a comedy. It's a crime drama thriller. It's a movie 
about a murder investigation of a slain businessman turns to clues found in an author's book about an eerily similar crime. Based on the 2008 article, True Crimes, a postmodern murder mystery, which was written by David Gran. So in addition to Jim Carrey, this movie also stars Charlotte Gainsbourg. And this movie looks pretty serious from the, the poster. Hopefully it's better than the number 23, which was the other stab at being serious that Jim Carrey's done. But if that movie's coming out in the theater near me, I'll check it out, especially if it has Jim Carrey in it. But I can't guarantee whether or not I'm going to see that film. But in any event, that just about does it for this week's edition of Words on Film. Again, I am your host and movie critic, Dan. Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, uh, the views and opinions expressed on words on film about movies or otherwise are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of the employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. And as usual, words on film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And until my next show, this is Dan Burke saying, I'll see you at the movies.